So the world has gone nuts for Dune 2, and rightly so. But I purposefully have seen it now twice, and I wanted to take a few days after the second viewing to really let it fester in my mind, let it work for me, or equally not work for me. I completely understand the praise that the movie has got, and it is deserving of every single bit of that praise. However, <clears throat> I do not believe that this is a five-star movie the way everyone is claiming, though it will rank very highly for me. Stay tuned until the end of the video to find out what the final score is. But this movie is not without its problems. Some of its own making, some which it simply cannot escape from due to the source material. But let's be very clear. I adore this movie. Faults and all, this movie is spectacular. Let me... Let me get into the positives here, because let's talk about what everyone is talking about, and that's the visuals and the sound. The technical prowess on display in this movie truly is something for the ages. It ushers in memories of the first viewing of Avatar in 2009, the first viewing of Jurassic Park back in the early 90s, the first time I imagine people saw Star Wars in the 70s. This Dune franchise that directed Denis Villeneuve, and side note to all the Americans out there, I'm a Frenchman, despite the accent, je parle français, je suis français, stop saying Denis Villeneuve. Look at my mouth. Villeneuve. It's a very, very slight F. Villeneuve. How to pronounce Denis Villeneuve's name? Denis Villeneuve. That aside, what he has achieved with this movie is going to echo throughout film history for the foreseeable future, possibly forever, because it is a remarkable achievement. The, the visuals themselves are such a brilliant leveling up from the first movie where despite being beautiful, for too long we were confined to the sort of sterile, almost boring halls and hangers of the first movie. Now we've gone full Lawrence of Arabia in this movie and with, with the force of and might of the best visual creators in Hollywood at his disposal, Denis Villeneuve has really, really brought the desert setting to a beautiful, stunning, minimalist highlight. Um, so minimalist, in fact, it almost looks like Marie Kondo has gone into the desert and just tidied things up. Well done if you get that reference. The, the, the visuals are striking, but we're gonna lead into how they become a problem unto themselves when we get into the negatives. And the, the sound, the score from Hans Zimmer, the sound design, the little things like when it, the, the way that swords clash and there's a lingering echo with the blades fracturing against each other. There has been no expense spared to the attention to detail when it comes to the visuals and sound in this movie. And frankly, your senses are completely assaulted by this movie. And that's one of the main reasons why it is such a remarkable achievement. I also have to say, as far as the story is concerned, specifically with some of the characters, Denis Villeneuve makes some very bold choices about kind of deviating from the original source material. Um, look, story-wise, we pick up exactly where the first movie left off. We've just done a kind of very bloody Game of Thrones-style initiation. Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides, who, by the way, has got way too many epitaphs in this movie. Too many epitaphs for such a young character to be saddled with, frankly. Madi, Muadib, Usul, Lisan al Gaib, Kwiat, Hadarak. Enough! <laughs> Get it? And that's not that. That's not the movie's fault. That's down to the source material. But, jeez, the epitaphs. Anyway, he's gone full T. E. Lawrence. He's working now with the Fremen in order to help free planet Arrakis against the evil fascist aggressors, the Harkonnens. I refuse to call them the Harkonnens like the movie suggested, it's Harkonnens. The two characters I want to focus on throughout the story though, which I really, really enjoyed, were uh, Jessica, played by, played by Rebecca Ferguson, who they do an interesting thing here because if you haven't read the books, 
The sister's a lot more involved here, but this thing they've done with the unborn sister communicating with the mother and the mother having much more of a prominent role, for me, despite not really fe featuring that heavily in the, mo in, in the books, work the treat in the movies. The other character I loved what they did with was uh, Chani, played by Zendaya. Now, again, very different from the source material. Chani has got much more of, I guess, a personality in this movie. She's very, very much against the cultish, religious believings of some of the Fremen, and she remains unsold on Paul Atreides being the grand savior of Arrakis. And throughout the movie, she's constantly reminding us, hey, be careful. This is how martyrs, tyrants, and dictators come to power. It, it's very clear she's not entirely on board with this, with this campaign that Atreides is working his way into and also being forced into. And she remains the voice of warning, which she's just not in the books. So this is one of the few instances where I think what Denis Villeneuve has done actually outweighs the works of Frank Herbert. What he's done with Jessica and Chani, lovely stuff. And from the characters, I just want to talk about the acting as another positive, because Jesus Christ, the acting in this movie is special. Um, I mean, the standouts for me were Javier Bardem and uh, Austin Butler. We'll talk about Austin in a moment. But yeah, man, the... the whoo. There wasn't a... W Actually, that's not true. There was one week performance in this movie, and that was from Christopher Walken, who I just thought didn't entirely fit here. It could, they, they literally could have cast anyone. Um, but the performances, Javier Bardem playing the kind of hardline zealot, um, Josh Brolin, who... Josh Brolin, when he entered the, entered the sphere in this movie, just instantly brought the movie up to an even greater level. It was a, a wonderful thing to behold. Chalamet, I believe, is the second coming of Daniel Day-Lewis. He is that damn good. Zendaya is possibly one of the most underrated actresses on the planet, and people still think she's great. And despite that, I still think she's underrated. Class act. There wasn't, other than Walken, really a weak standout. Even the kind of tes uh, tertiary characters, like... Florence Pugh, who's not in this for much, but she bought the fire, man. It just worked top to bottom. However, with this is the weird thing about this movie, because with every single positive that I've gone through, each positive has a slight tinge of negative to it. So I've already talked about the visuals. One thing I forgot to add was when we actually went to the dread pla home planet of the Harkonnens, and they go full Wagnerian in it and go black and white and we get this almost gladiatorial battle with Fade Ruther, played by Austin Butler. That was my favourite moment of the movie and I wanted to see more of the Harkonnens. I really, really did. And actually, we'll get onto that because the movie kind of suffers from not seeing them more. But here we go with the negatives. So, as good as Austin Butler was, and he was my favourite part of the movie, frankly... There was also an element of him maybe going a bit too Christian Bale Batman in this. I thought, and it's a weird one, it's a double-edged sword, because I thought what he did in terms of trying to mimic the delivery that Stellan Skarsgård has for his character, clearly showing that they are related, very growly, very almost shake, Shakespearean in delivery, he nailed it. But it got very growly at the end, almost unnecessarily so. And th there were just parts of me where I thought, you're great, but you're at an 11 now? Just reel it back into a 10 and you're there. Never really took me out, but there were, well, kind of, because there were one or two points where I thought, you, you just down a tiny bit and you're there. Now when it comes to the visuals, I've already sung their praises, so you know how much I like them. Marie Kondo minimalism for the desert, as I've dubbed it. But here's the thing. I almost feel there needed to be a little bit more ruthlessness in the editing suite here. I almost feel that Denis Villeneuve got kind of carried away with just how beautiful every single frame of this movie, uh, movie is. Because this added to the runtime. The runtime of this movie at 2 hours 47... It's just too long. Um, I never once felt like there was, you know, 
sore bum syndrome where you, you're consciously aware that you're watching something that's too long. Because the strange thing is, is that the length in this movie isn't related to specific scenes or character arcs or any story beat that I would actually remove. The content, narrative content of this movie is completely necessary. I wouldn't remove anything. I would have showed a bit of restraint in how long we linger on a specific beautiful scene. Um, I get it. The light is stunning. The visuals are stunning. The minimalism is, is just, it, it, it's an orgasm for the eyes. But did you really need to linger for kind of 25 seconds at a time on a single frame? Or could you have got the same effect by reeling it in a bit and bringing it down to sort of 10 to 12 seconds a frame? This might sound super pedantic, but when you calculate 10 to 12 seconds gained per frame, pretty frame, over the course of a two hour 47 movie, that does start to stack up. And you start to wonder like, you could have achieved the same slow burn effect and let the visuals bring the world to life without necessarily having to linger on sh on shots and frames for as long as you did. So it is a negative, but it's still a very minor negative. Um, I mean, the other thing I wanna talk about is, this is more of a problem with the book than with Denis Villeneuve's delivery of the book's content. As terrifying, as Fade Ruther and the, Har and the Harkonnens on their home planet were. On Arrakis, I was never under the impression that the Freemans were in any way, shape or form under any threat. The opening scene gave me a bit of intimidation from the Harkonnens, but real talk, real talk, the Freemans kick ass. Like, they're masters of their environment, Every single time they go to battle, as shown by the movie, there's minimal casualties, if any. They've got all the technology in the world they need to conduct their guerrilla warfare, and they're very, very good at it. And even when they go into big battle at the end, pretty much they wipe the floor with their oppressors. And it just makes me wonder, was there enough, was there enough threat created by the Harkonnens in this movie. It existed in the previous movie, no doubt. But in the previous movie, it wasn't the Freemen who were being fought against, other than kind of in the background. It was the fall of House Atreides. In this movie, I didn't get a clear enough message that the Freemen were ever really under threat. There was, minor spoiler, that scene where Fade Ruther arrives and he lays their foundations to waste. They didn't really suffer from that. <laughs> like, if anything, it just pissed them off more. They kind of went full beast mode on the Harkonnens after that happened, rightfully so. But the fact that they had the ability to just go, oh, you did that? You dead. Um, I, I never thought the Freemans were at risk here, to be honest. So the fact that you're trying to tell me about a world's indigenous people being at threat from a foreign invader, that didn't really land for me. Final negative I'll bring out. This is not the movie's fault. This is the fault of the subject matter. There is an inescapable, unfortunate truth here. This is, however you slice it, yet again, another white savior story. The Freeman, as said by Frank Herbert when he originally wrote Dune, the Freeman are a not very loose, not very subtle interpretation of Arab culture. Reimagined and repackaged, of course. Um, it did bother me a bit that all the characters that, of the Freeman were very whitewashed. Very, very whitewashed. And it would have been nice to see, I don't know, a bit more diversity playing the Freeman. Zenday is there. I get it. Fine. A little bit more wouldn't have gone amiss. But it is a white saviour story. I appreciate the book was written in 1956. Different time, different sensibilities, different look. And through no fault of Denis Villeneuve, I do question if that type of thematic subject matter has a place in 2024. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'll say again. I adore this film. But really think about it. Paul Atreides is just another white saviour. And that comes to a wider point I'd like to make about Dune, the novel. And some of you may think this is sacrilegious, but work with me. If you've read the book, book, sir, you know there's some weird stuff in here. I mean, the fact that there's penis addiction that crops up later on in some of the books. Just weird stuff. But the, here's a question I pose. Is Dune, the novel, more important than it is actually great? Here's what I mean. There have been works that have come both before Dune and after Dune, your Lord of the Rings, your Game of Thrones, which have got better written characters, better developed worlds. That's not to say the ones in Dune aren't great, but they've got better written characters, better developed worlds, a more clear political confrontation that permeates the books. Lord of the Rings, Good and Evil, House, you know, uh, Song of Fire and Ice. It's very clear where the politics lie there. <laughs> Scattered and all over the place. But the, the politics in June are very, very juvenile. However, what it created for all the novels and stories and grandiose epic tales that followed it, it cannot be disputed how influential this book is and how influential this story is and how... All of the stories that have followed the written word of June are effectively just leaning on its back and standing on the shoulders of June and owe it an infinite debt of gratitude. But there's an argument to be made they've kind of gone and done it better but wouldn't exist without it. So I pose the question, is June actually more of an important novel than it is a great novel? Just something to consider. I want to hear what you guys think. But to end on a positive, just because I've rambled on a bit about the negatives, least we be under any confusion, my final score for Dune. What am I scoring, Dune? Dune Part 2 is going to get a 9 out of 10 for me. It is undoubtedly one of the finest films of the year. It is, from a technical standpoint an adaptation standpoint, a visual storytelling standpoint, from an acting perspective. It is a work of pure genius, though it does come with some very, very clear flaws, some which it's guilty of, and they're not big flaws, I've highlighted them, some which it cannot escape from as it is based on a subject matter from the 50s. But it is a remarkable achievement nonetheless. It's something you should see on the biggest screen possible. I saw it in IMAX twice and you should do the same. Watch this. I, I, I'm an advocate for independent cinemas, but this is something you need to see on the biggest screen you can possibly find. Um, it's a marvelous film. Some people dub it this generation's Empire Strikes Back. I get it. I absolutely get it. It is... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a quote here from The New Yorker because I like what they said. Denis Villeneuve's sequel is better than its predecessor. Only in a few extravagant moments does it rise, rise above proficiency and flirt with transcendence. And I think that's, that's the perfect thing to say because is it as transcendent as it could have been? No. But is it a work of epic proportions that deserves to be praised for years and years to come? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's wonderful. And so over to you guys. What did you think of Dune Part 2? I want to know your thoughts, your comments, your feedback to some of the negatives I had to point out. It's wonderful. So let's share in the comment section. Like the video if you haven't done so already. Please do subscribe to the channel. There should be another video up here or down here rather for you to watch and a subscribe button up top for you to keep watching more content on the channel but that's it from me for now thank you for watching until the end and i will see you guys very soon right here on the silver screen dudes bye for now